evening, everyone. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. It's my extreme pleasure tonight to introduce and welcome Thomas C. Hufka. Thomas C. Hufka is a professor emeritus from the Department of Architecture at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, where he taught for over 20 years. Professor Hufka's presentation focuses on the historical development of New Hampshire's farm architecture. Professor Hubka is best known for his book, Big House, Little House, Back House Barn, The Connected Farm Buildings of New England, for which he received the Abbott Lowell Cummings Award for the best book in American vernacular architecture. <coughs> Hubka has also received awards for his book about Polish wooden synagogues titled Resplendent Synagogue, Architecture and Worship in, the 18, in, 18, in an 18th century Polish community. His recently published book about American popular housing is titled Houses Without Names, Architecture Nomenclature, and the Classification of America's Common Houses. He is currently living in Portland, Oregon, and teaches architectural courses at the University of Oregon, Portland State University, and Portland Community College. He is working on his next book, how Working Class Homes Became Modern, Housing Improvement in America, 1900 to 1940. He returns each summer to his brother's connected farm in Bridgeton, Maine. Mm -hmm. Copies of the professor's books will be on sale after the lecture, and I encourage you to come back and see him and have a signed book for you. Please join me in welcoming Thomas Huff. Hello. Um, I, I had a wonderful tour today with um, Jenny uh, Shirtliff, um, and I saw your community. I mean, this you know, you have a fabulous community of, of architecture and, and buildings and all, and um, I've been through here a couple times on um, my travels uh, uh, looking at farmsteads and all that, but uh, I haven't looked closely at, at your, your town, and it certainly have a wonderful architecture. I'd, I'd really like to give a tour and uh, talk about buildings here and all that, but uh, we have other things uh, to, to, to talk about today. Um, a couple of ground rules. Um, uh, this is the universal sign for pick it up, I can't hear, and or you can also say repeat. It's also repeat, you know, I didn't quite get it and all that. If, you wanted, so, uh, if you've got a burning question, you know, raise it and, and I'll answer it and all that. I prefer maybe at the end, but sometimes, you know, you got to have it. My students, you know. <laughs> yeah, it hit you hard, and you, you got to answer that, and, and also I, I can do that if if if, if you prefer. Uh, sometimes, <clears throat> um, I guess we can do with the lights here. Uh, we don't have to. It's, can you see this? Uh, if it looks too uh, dim or something like that, we can turn them down or something like that. Big house, little house, back house, barn. Um, have any of you uh, ever heard that as a, as a child? I mean, maybe you read my book, or you know, look, that'd be nice uh, that you've heard that before. But have any of you heard that as a child or heard people talk about that expression? Um, some of you have, and, and uh, you, 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 uh, you might be older if, if you have uh, in some ways. Uh, when I first started out uh, doing this shtick uh, 40 years ago uh, um, as a young architectural professor, you know, thinking I knew it all but didn't, and all. I'd lecture at, at Granges. Uh, these are agricultural societies of, of, of New Hampshire. Oh, I, I one, one correction on the, uh, 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 my title of this. It's, uh, it's the Connected Farm Buildings of Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it, that was on my, uh, it was handed out to, to uh, sorry, my fault, my fault. My fault. So in, of northern New England, as you'll find out, this is a phenomenon of northern New England, and it goes down into Massachusetts and, and things like that, too. So, um, but, um, and, and, and Vermont. So, so I, I talk at these granges and give uh, early versions of this. I didn't know a lot, but I started to uh, think it's an important subject and why and talk about it to lots of people. And I say to these granges, uh, granges is farmers and farmer wives. And uh, this isn't city, this isn't people from away or anything like that. Usually it's, it's local, local people. And um, I'd say, have any of you heard Big House, Little House? And they, a couple of women in the back of the room, they don't shout out or anything like that. They were the oldest woman in the back of the room. Now they're mostly gone, um, the, the, the women that I remember. Um, but they were, they were recalling their youth in 1890s to 1910 or something like that. So that's that period, um, early, early period. And what they told me about was games that they, they 
children's games, women's children's games uh, that they would do. And there's a couple of versions of Stone Teacher or um, Skip Rope, or maybe, but the dominant one, easily the dominant one, was, was a, a game about where are you going to get married? In what building of the connected farmstead are you going to get married? Big house, little house, back house, barn. What are you going to, what are you going to land on? If you can, that's the kind of logic of that. Well, if you know, I mean, if, if you know these buildings a little bit, where would you want to go? The big house. It's the house in the front, the biggest architectural style. Funerals are held there a little bit sometimes. Not marriages so much within the community, but, but the official house and all that. That's where you'd want to get married. But what if you landed on the back house? What if you're going to get married in the back house? <laughs> guffaw, guffaw. What might that mean? It's the privy. That's where the privy is. <laughs> Just so you see the logic of the game, you know, you know I don't know how, how, but anyway, that's the logic of the game and everyone understood that. Or the barn, because you're a hayseed or something like that, anyway, and you don't want to land there. Anyway, that was the logic. Kids sometimes have, a, have, they cut through adult logic and they can get down to the core of things sometimes. And in this case, they did. Four-part system, big house, little house, back house, barn, is the system of the dominant architectural organization of farmsteads throughout northern New England. There is no common recognized name. For most farmers, it's the Jones place, the farm, farmstead. <laughs> and they don't, I'm an architectural historian. I name it the connected farm buildings of New England. I mean, that's, that's academic stuff and all that. But here's the kind of logic uh, uh, used by, and this is vernacular. This is kind of the local culture, naming uh, the architecture, and that's what I'm going to talk about. As a bracket here, I've traveled through Vermont, not so much as certainly other places in New England, because you have less connected farms here. I would say about 30 to 40 percent of your farmstead buildings where you had dominant agriculture were in this connected arrangement of connecting house to barn with a string of connected buildings. I can't officially say that or anything like that. And it changes in different, in your northern Vermont, far less and all that, in southern areas more and all that. And all of a sudden, this stops at the Green Mountains. And when you go down uh, on the slopes uh, to Champlain and other, it doesn't exist. And there's reasons for that. And, and, and we'll talk about that in, 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 just, in just a second. OK, next. OK, there's big house, little house, uh, back house, barn. Now, if you're really from away and you, know, you need to have an explanation, big house, little house, back house, and barn. Here's a, a lovely picture from the Kennebunk area. I guess this is not going to show on this. Oh, darn. Um, there's some screens where this doesn't. Uh, so I'll use my finger. OK, fine. So we I guess um, it's fading. You must pick a screen here. Is that the uh, that the issue? Maybe the battery just gave out. There it is. It's it's foggy. It uh, could be uh, okay. I'll, I'll point. It's just a small crowd here. Okay, a lovely scene from Kenny Bunk um, uh, area. Good collection of here. Presumably these these. Uh, Girls are, are, are saying big house, little house, back house, barn, and they're playing the game uh, uh, together there. Next. I've got thousands of these, and I'd love to show you them all, and it's lots of connected farm architecture. And if you go tootle around the window like I've done, you know, you just you, you constantly get this. And so I got hundreds of these, but this is the architecture I'm telling you about. The big deal, if you're really, if you're not farm folk or anything like that here, here's the house and here's the barn, and there's a bunch of connected buildings together. But there's all different variations of that. And so that individual farmers are cooking up different variations. But the basic, the formula of the string of buildings connecting house and, and barn together is, is a characteristic of, 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 of uh, northern, northern New England. Next. I think they're all beautiful in many ways. Mm -hmm. As I started out as a young historian, I was, I'm not a historian, I'm an architect trained and all that, but I tried to be a historian. I tried to say, um, well, I'm going to find the history of these buildings, and, and they, presumably they go back and, and all that. And I kept finding, you know, here's a house that was 1810 or, or so, but the buildings that are here weren't 1810, they were newer. And I kept finding that, and I couldn't find any group of buildings that went back very far. And, and I'm a smart guy, right? You know, huh? But it didn't, it didn't make sense. And because presumably, this would have come across on the Mayflower or the Massachusetts colony and, and then spread out into Vermont and New Hampshire and all that sort of thing, right? 
Well, that's what I thought. That's what they, I was told. And that's what I was looking for. Once in a while, I would see a photograph on the mantle of this house. And I, would find, I found out that these, this whole string here wasn't there. These are in the field, and I can establish that. And they were out there and there, and they're disconnected. And I've kept on finding that, that I kept pushing history back. And all of a sudden, it, they were disconnected. Dong, ding. <laughs> Maybe they connected them all at once for some kind of reason or, or something like that. And so this, is, this wasn't, no one's researched this uh, area. The people study houses like this, uh, like your house up there, that's fine. But, it, but people didn't exactly look at the, the rest of the complex and all that. So I was, I was excited by the possibility of what's going on. Next. So this is the Nevers Bennett house. I got their history and all that. Primarily what I've done is to record hundreds of times the history of how farms developed. I mean, I may not know why they developed. I don't know if I'm intellectually so smart about, but, but I'm a plugger. I mean, I got, I got hundreds of, of, of farmsteads that I can document, and this is what happened. And furthermore, next. What, and it comes down to what I'm trying to do today is to say there was a period, earlier period, where houses were separate houses and barns, and then there was a period where they put it together. And well, why? What, uh, what's going on here? Now, one of the things that I, I talk to historians, uh, very famous historians, to try to figure this out and, and, uh, and all, and I would talk to a couple, and you could, they could talk about um, forces of, of um, history, Bolshevism and industrialism and, and agribusiness, and, and maybe those are the things that are, that are happening here. That's a way to do it. Next. Another way to do it is to find out the people that were involved with this building. So it's a, what would have motivated Charles and Charlotte Bennett to take this disconnected building and put it together. It was a relatively wealthy, uh, upper 30% of 20% of agricultural uh, wealth in, in the country. Well, here they are. Here's Ch he, uh, Charles married uh, uh, into this family, well, rather wealthy family here. And they um, conduct this building experiment between about 1870 to 1880, 90 or something like that. And so, what they did, Charles and Charlotte, they take the kitchen that was in here and put it out into an L. We think that's an older uh, building that they moved into line here. We don't know exactly that over there. And they take down their agricultural buildings over there, and they move their, the stable into line with the house, and they move this barn from three miles away, and they disassemble and put it together and <laughs> connected farm. They buy about 1870 or so, they made this connected farm. Well, what would have motivated Charles and Charlotte? Relatively wealthy. This was a good farm. They didn't suffer any depression or <laughs> psychic issues. Uh, uh, but they put it all together. How come? What would have motivated them to do that? And others and others to do that. I talk to my students about this, and then I smile at them. My students, they don't know farmers from plumbers. Okay? They, so they, so I have to tell them. I said, well, I could be, I could be fooling you. Because maybe these aren't guys aren't farmers. Maybe he didn't do that. Why is he a farmer? How do you know he's a farmer? How do you know I'm not kidding you about him? Because he's dressed up. I mean, that doesn't, no farmer, for Sunday or something like that, he dresses up like that. His what hands. A, mm -hmm. His hands. Never shake a hand with a farmer? No. I've done that. Here's a really white hand of an architect, OK, mm -hmm. professor. OK. <laughs> Sometimes I shake a hand and say, does this guy have a glove on? You know, no, it's a hand that gets beaten up by rocks and, and all, to the modern farmer's machinery, but still the same kind of beaten up kind of uh, physical hand and all that. That's, he's a farmer. <laughs> he's busted his hands in rock walls and machinery and all that, just like any other, other kind of farmer. And he's the one primarily, and, and Charlotte, who, who, who made this building connection. So how come? Next slide. Is there any, is there any discussion? Uh, well, uh, is there anybody who would say, well, it, just as God made green apples? He didn't go outdoors. Feed the livestock. Yeah. You got to walk from the house to the barn in the winter. And that's why they made connective farms. Was it maybe copycat? One Could be copycat. One guy do it. One guy, you know, it got to be a good copycat there. Gotta, that person who did initiated that, 
You think they all got led by the nose and off the lemmings off the cliff or something? I don't know. Okay. There are environmental reasons why you'd want to walk to the house in the barn in the winter. I've traveled, I've interviewed hundreds of farmers and a couple of them in the deep winter. And, you know, and I'd be outside with them and I'd turn them and say, well, you know, your father, you know, the guy who built this complex over here, did he walk from the house in the barn in the winter to get to use? No. No. You ever follow a farmer in the winter? A guy like me freezes to death, but I was brave, you know. I keep on writing, you know, I remember my hands couldn't even write and all that. These guys are out in the winter, every winter's day of their life. The idea of them having to limp from the house in the barn as the major reason why they connected their house and the barns together to make a convenient passage? This major building reorganization? Whoa. Okay, now I'm going to come on with a lot of professor reasons why this is, and so you can be skeptical about that, but at least I hope I can, I can say at some level they did that. At some point they put, next slide, they put these things together and there's some reasons why they did this. So I'm going to give you some factoids now, okay? <laughs> Facts are a little in jeopardy now as we know, but uh, here, here, are, here are some factoids that you might want to say, consider, okay? But the big one here that you do want to consider is here's New England. Okay, here we are. And here we are, center of Vermont, right about here. Okay, you got it here? So there's New England. Here's the Cape Cod, and here's Connecticut, here's New York. And here's the line. It's a, to the coast, and it's to uh, Mass southern Massachusetts, whatever. Spine of the uh, Green Mountains over here for you Vermonters and all that. Over, up, they're not up, up to Aristic. That's the line of connected farms in the universe. Outside of that line, there are no connected farms. None. Zilch. Russian is interesting. Yet. <laughs> no. Yeah. All those. None. This should surprise some of you. If you're local, you'd say, whoa. I thought the logic was so logical. We would... I, I, I can demonstrate. Other geographers have demonstrated this. Uh, Walensky, and a geographer, and others have, have demonstrated easily this map is absolutely correct. And outside of that, well, why is that? Any of you uh, here at uh, Garrison Keeler, uh, Norwegian bachelor farmers? If you, do you know a bunch of farmers in the whole universe that would, that would want to get connected? Your winters are relatively mild. Uh, my wife and I, we live in Wisconsin. I mean, it ain't so cold as Minnesota. And they never connected their farms ever. Not early, not late, not ever. Yankees are colder. <laughs> they get colder or something like that, or uh, keep on coming. Um, it's hard to sustain lots of your ideas, so keep, keep your mind on that one. Here's another factor. Here's a, here's a farmer that represents lots of other farmers who streamed out of Vermont and New Hampshire and Maine and Massachusetts and went west. And they made new farms out there. And here's a farmer who le left Vermont, uh, I forget the, the town of Vermont, and he goes out to um, Buffalo, area of New York, in Buffalo, and he builds a disconnected house and farm like every other farmer who left New England uh, before 1850 or, or so. Agricultural people basically take what they knew in an older place, and when they come to a new place, they build this is about the same thing, usually. German farmers come from Germany, build a German barn, for crying out loud, just like they did in Germany. Okay? That's usually the case. And they did it here. But they didn't, when they streamed out of New Vermont and New Hampshire and Maine, they didn't have the connected farm before about 1850 or so. And by then, once they go out of there, they certainly weren't going into a new area already settled and bring this relatively exotic uh, connected organization together. Okay, I'm just trying to load you up here about, you keep on chawing on that uh, the cold weather uh, uh, theory. Can I ask if all the, the, the big hospital house barns buildings face have the same orientation? I'm gonna get to that. You just see that a little bit, uh, yeah. Um, it depends on your where, where's your well, side of the road, where's your where's your major crop lands? Uh, do you got rocky soil in this part? You know, there's a lot of reasons for that. But it's not. That there's a south-facing orientation for many of the buildings, but we'll get to that in just okay. a second. Okay, so keep keep that hold that one there. Okay, so there's a that's I'm trying to chop at you with your cold weather theory here. Um, it's, it looks a little vulnerable to me, but I'm just yeah, I'm prejudiced, so no question. Next. So what I'm trying to tell you today is that 
and the heart of my theory is that before 1830, there weren't any connected farms for most farmers. But if you built a new farm in 1850, and mostly in New England, this new style of connected buildings was highly recommended. Most farm built buildings that are in the connected fashion over here were built between 1850 and 1900, 95% of them. Okay, so 50 year, 50 year threshold. Did it suddenly get cold? Hmm? Okay, now you heard of 18, 1800 and froze to death? Some of your historians. Okay, that's the winter of 1812, 13, 14. There were remarkably cold winters way before this. Had nothing to do with that. During this 50-year period, when most people built connected farms, average winters. But I can prove that from U.S. agriculture uh, weather uh, uh, statistics and all that. Anyway, it didn't get cold or anything like that. Did Maine and New Hampshire and Vermont farmers? Did they get colder? That's an interesting theory. And they kind of bundled up and then had to do. That's, that's a tough one. I, 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 I can't go there. Anyway, here we go. We're going to go and see what happens. Next. So, now, if you're from away, big house, little house, back house, barn, okay? So, I'm going to go through each of these and tell you about how they were developed within this connected organization and then put them all together to see if I can reconstitute the, the reasons why they made connected forms. Next. So, big house. A big house is the front house, the house that's nearest to the road, usually, and all that. That is kind of orientation, but doesn't, you know, usually near, nearest the road. So it can, there's, a, there's a big house before they made connected farms, and there's a big house after they made connected farms in terms of the overall building development. This is average farmers. You've got a town of great second story, two story buildings, and all that. So there's average farmers, there's a kind of one story cape, is a kind of average. So here's your dominant house that, that, English people built for 200 years in America. You see the Cape Cod house, one story. It, it was a center chimney over here. I should have a better picture. So center chimney, three fireplaces and all that. It's a fireplace house. Heavy timber construction. When they may start to make connected farms after about 1850, this is a stud construction house. Balloon frame, you know, so light, light timbers and all that. Usually some, some heavy timbers, but not most. You see a thin chimney like that, it's a stove chimney. Okay, big chimneys are fireplace chimneys, okay? They're putting stoves in here, the development of the stove as, 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 part, of, as part of the organization. So fireplaces to stove is part of that, heavy, heavy timber construction system. And next. Doesn't that house also have a knee wall compared to the other? It has, have a, has a knee wall. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Next, uh, go back if you can. There's lots of ways that we can talk about this. Uh, this uh, this is, doesn't... Now they're both they're both plate, uh, maybe a little one or something like that. But that's you know part of those those uh, big houses could be uh, one story or a story and a half, knee wall, and or two story, two story. Farmer's choice, farmer's wealth is really that doing that. Next, <coughs> little house, little house is the kitchen. The kitchen is universal on the farm. The, it's the center of the farm. It's the center of agricultural life. It has always been so. And it's from Reykjavik to Jakarta to, to, to Brattleboro. It's the center of, of the universe on the farm. I love this picture. Yankees don't take pictures of their, of their women out in fields and all that. It's just not one of the things you do. German, uh, anyway, we, have, ah, we don't have pictures of, but we do have this picture. And we're romanticizing about uh, the, the, the life in the uh, farmhouse kitchen. Anyway, it, it's, a, it's a relative rough life. And my big theory here, big one, is to say these people modernized. I know this stuff sounds old timey. The, the buildings look old or something like that. But they were modernizing. And to understand what they did, you have to understand their modernization. Well, I've already talked about the stove already a, a little bit. They changed from fireplaces to stoves. So here's the stove in Aunt Ruth's uh, kitchen over there. Within a relatively short period, Vermont actually is a stove production center in some ways. They got, you guys got a lot of tinkering Yankees here you're working with metal. And so uh, you got your uh, production of stoves in various, uh, um, anyway. Between 1820 to 1850, farms became, uh, they, they tore out their fireplaces and put in stoves or they left our fireplaces and they put in stoves as, as part of it. So here's a typical remodeling of the kitchen over here. But look at this. What's behind this stove? Mm -hmm. oh, What's that? That's a fireplace. So over and over, there's the, the farmhouse fireplace. You board it over and 
put a modern stove in front of it. That's part of this improvement that's going on, this connected farm organization. So the stove is one of the first ones here. There's a pump over here for the farm wife, getting flowing water somehow into there. This is an area where, whether you have cisterns in the cellar, uh, Jenny, uh, any uh, cisterns? Uh, you don't have any here. In other parts of, of, of New England, you, got some, you, 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 pump out, you pump out of a, a well storage area or something like that. Or you have gravity feed from whatever. You get water into the kitchen, and that's part of doing that. So that's also there. Linoleum on the floor, we're modernizing. So, question two. Yeah, we do have some cisterns. My old house had a thing in the basement. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, well in the basement. Yeah, well in the basement or cistern. But hey, all those are part of a metal mechanical, uh, new, uh, that's new in 1840 or something, and they, it, it progresses after that. Anyway, the little house, kitchen. And so what happens in this organization next architecturally, next, is that early houses were either big, if they had world war wealth, and they, they took the kitchen. When you say, I see a house like this, the kitchen is the back area over there, kitchen in the L. If you're from away, an L is the extension off the back of your house and all that. Or you have a small house and you add a bigger front house or big house to it. So that by 1840, when you built a new house, it was a house with parlor and bedrooms and an L and a kitchen. Almost connected. I mean, it's not connected farm, but it's, it's two buildings uh, that are working to that arrangement. This is absolutely universal. It happens all over. In your village, it's happened, it happens all the time and all that. Sometimes you get two kitchens. You get the older kitchen that used to be in here or the, here, and then you get another, the new kitchen in the L, fairly, fairly common. Uh, or this happened here at this house, right, Jenny? <laughs> here in this house, it happened. <laughs> so a new kitchen developing in the L, and the L gets sheds added to it and all that. So that, that's, that's happening. Next. I always tell my... Uh, I, with my students, I show them this and say, what's the story? What's going on here? Tell me the story about this. I don't want to go too much for this makeup things and all that. But there's an important story over there. Anybody want to synthesize? It's still for the place of an old fireplace. Look at this. What's this? That's a fireplace. And therefore, what room is this? It was the kitchen. It was the kitchen. The old kitchen. It was the kitchen. When you see a stove, a, a fireplace this size is kitchen. There's the ovens on one side and all that, and it's got to be a kitchen. This could have been the kitchen, I'll say it was, for her baking her front side, freezing her back side, uh, working in, in, in this romantic fireplace over here. And here now she has a Victorian uh, stove. Presumably out through that door is the new kitchen in the L and all that, and that is the revolution I'm talking about, okay? So here it is, the old kitchen in, in the major house, and the new kitchen is in the L, two-part arrangement, big house, little house. Over and over, hundreds of thousands of times, this occurred, this scene, type of scene, occurred in, in, in New England. Next. Back house. Big house, little house, back house. So it can be here, because the four buildings, you could see that. But it, here it happens the same. It's the same organization. Big house. The little house is subsumed within a continuous L to the barn. But it's still big house, little house, back house. And barn. The same, it works the same way, even though the parts are, 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 not, are not the same. Back house is harder to talk about because it's, it's, it's multiple agricultural operations happening there. It's uh, shearing sheep and slaughtering hogs and, and husking corn and storing this and storing that and woodworking material and wh all of that. Now that's different from other places because they don't have the variety that was forced on you. And I'm going to talk about that. So, but so I can't address it all here. I'll, I'll, I'll address it uh, uh, just a, a couple minutes. Next. The barn, okay. Barns are cool because they tell us about New England uh, architecture and the changes in them really tell us about what the changes were. And so there's a history of barn that's fairly easy once you understand the basic parts. There is a first phase where we call it the English barn and there's a second phase where we call it the, there's no exact name, the New England barn. But you can see the differences. The door is in the eave or side end of this barn. Sorry for this, this is an older uh, kind of foggy photo and all that. It's a 
You have about, so I've seen 20 of these in town. They're sometimes disguised and all that, but you've, you've got at least, well, you've got more than 20, but anyway, you've got it there. Um, the, this is the older barn. For 200 years in America, this barn was good enough. The, the English people come here from the English counties in England. They come, and for 200 years, 1620 to 1820, built, built an English barns, big ones, small ones, whatever. I can easily document that. And then they changed to a different kind of barn. And they changed this within a 20-year uh, period so that by 1840, when you built a new barn in anywhere uh, around Woodstock, you built this, this kind of barn with the barn door in the gable end. You're, you're in the town, and so there's a bracket here. I'm talking about the connected house and, and, and barn for farms. Most of your buildings that you have here are the connected house to stable, which is the same history, but it's for people who live in, in the city, who are merchants and, and bankers and uh, to average folk, mechanics as they used to call them, uh, people in the trades and all that. And it isn't dominant farm. But of course, in the people in the city had a cow and a horse, and so they were, you know, for us city folks, it's a farm. <laughs> but not really. But, uh, so I'm primarily talking about the farms, but everything I'm talking about holds true exactly for, the, for these buildings that you have in the city, the same kind of connection and making, but it's slightly different, and so, but I can't do it all. Anyway, this occurred. I can absolutely prove this. This is absolutely easy to occur. This is a bigger barn, bigger stock of agricultural uh, farm uh, tools are getting bigger. Cows are, people are getting bigger. Cows are getting bigger. Uh, anyway, bigger, bigger barns. Th this occurred in New England, and it occurs along with the establishment of the Connected Farm Organization. Next. There's reasons for this adaption. There's a multiple, it isn't just one reason and all that. But I'll give you one of the major ones is that you can add on to this New England type bond with the door and the gable end by making continuous bay additions. With the, with the English barn, you add to the side and you've got to get multiple doorways. It's, it's a little different, it's a little more, you lose a little space. But anyway, they did it. They abandoned this English barn and they adopted this all throughout northern New England, uh, every, everywhere. Next. So if you see if you see an English barn in line, this is there's a barn over here. You can't you can't see it. Sorry, you can't see it so well. But sometimes the back house is really an older English barn. It's just this one was moved from a position about here into line, and they built a new barn over there. And so your back house is then the earliest barn that was on this property. That's fairly common. And even in town here, you'll find that building, one of those buildings, to possibly be the old. Also, you just take down those buildings and you reuse. When you ever see an L, go in there, you usually see a higgly piggly kind of lots of different types of wood from lots of different dismantled buildings and all that, which is, which is fairly regular. Next. Barns are cool because they tell us about, about farmers' lives and all that. So just two things here. Here's a barn. I ask you to look at, and I just ask you, what's wrong with this? It's asymmetrical. They maybe gave out too much spiritus liquors, as they used to describe, <laughs> at the raisin, and you know, weren't looking, and all of a sudden, you know, oh, Smith located that barn door off to the side. What a mistake. No, not, not quite a mistake. When you see this, and you'll see this, I've seen it one here in your village, but I don't know here. Now, well, if you ask a kid to draw a barn, a picture of a barn with barn door, right in the center, as God intended, right? Well, okay. I mean, it's logical to do that. And by 1900, we were doing this. But this is the sign of one of the earliest versions of this. This is the cow bay. These are the cows are on this side, usually facing south over here. This wall often faces south. And here's the hay bay, thicker. Just purposeful and all that. And gradually, by 1900, I can date barns because this barn door starts sliding here. By 1900, you basically had your two bays on either side. Cows get bigger, people get bigger. Anyway, for whatever reasons. Uh, and standardization of construction and things like that. The barn door is located in the center over here. Anyways, look, impress your friends by saying, here we have an example of an early, early barn uh, with the door in the center. And we know it's an early version because of the offset. Fine. It's pretty, but I'll give you 95% on this one in terms of a, its occurrence over here. 
I showed this to my students, and I said, Barnes, tell us a lot about that. And, and if you know the answer, don't yell it out. And I say to them, well, what do you think happened here? And I say, to them, I'll give you a hint. It was, a turn, it was converted to a motel. <laughs> and they kind of giggle and all that. But that's almost right. But what kind of motel? Chicken. Chicken. A chicken motel. Chicken. <laughs> now here, I don't know your history, as I know other areas. The US uh, Department of Agriculture had absolute uh, booklets. They were sent out to farmers, but in New England also, where they said, uh, convert your old barn that's not making any money to chicken production. OK, and so here, this is, this is 1910 to 1920. Also, after World War II, uh, some people are still converting this. To, but anyway, so that happened to New England farms. And it's part of the story uh, that I'm telling here is that you guys and your farmers could not sustain a single cash crop ever. And because of that, that starts to make the, the motor for why these changes were made here. Farmers in other parts of the country, in Iowa, I go to Iowa, I give talks, I give one talk in Iowa, and um, uh, you know, in 1840, they come to Iowa, some from here and all that, and they establish their farms, and they start growing corn and hogs. And what do you think they're growing today? Corn, corn and hogs. Okay, you guys never, ever could do that. You couldn't sustain one crop, although you tried. And a very good example of that is your basic crop that English people came over from England. What's your basic cash crop? Wheat, wheat. I mean, it goes back to the Stone Age, I guess. But anyway, wherever it comes, they come to America and they grow wheat, and that's your major <coughs> cash crop. In 1830, you guys couldn't send your wheat to, I don't know, if you, if you took it down to Champlain or uh, uh, if you took it to, to, on the railway by then to um, uh, Portsmouth or Boston, you couldn't, you couldn't make a living off it because you were outsold by Ohio farmers. And what's the date of, and what happened in 1820 that we refer to that, that starts this terrible process of undercutting you guys, 1820? Erie Canal, okay, Erie Canal opens up five years and ten years for sure, sure after that opened up, you couldn't, you couldn't sell your major cash crop that has sustained you for eons or a long time, okay, at least in America. You, you could eat bread, I mean, you could make your own bread, that's cool, but you, you, you couldn't make it your dominant crop as it had always been. And, you, and one after another you kept doing that. You guys didn't go sheep like uh, New Hampshire guys did here. You know, there was a little sheep farming over here, but there's, there's eras when you, they could make it sheep and they turned into some of your areas here went, went sheep. By 1840, all of a sudden you couldn't do that again. Australia opens up and all that. Anyway, they undercut you over and over and over again. That is the story of New England farming. So what are you going to do? You know, some go west. Uh, so when is other people stay here, so stay tuned. Next. There's some other facts about facts. This is some interesting tidbits about, about barns. What do we call this? It's a cupola. OK, that's the untruth button. It's just going off. It's gone off a couple times. We haven't heard it and all that so much. I want a, I want a V word here. Oh, now I get, the, I get the ventilator and all that. It can be called a cupola. You know, we're all city folks, basically, and all that. But if it's farmers here, you know, it's uh, calling out a cupola. This you call a cupola. This, by the way, is in um, Yarmouth, OK? And so if it's in Yarmouth, OK, and it's a cupola, what's the story that we usually tell about that? Widow. Yeah. Widow. So there's the widow, or presumably she's going to be a widow pretty sure, certainly if their ship doesn't come in. Looking, looking, come on, you guys. You know, I'm an architectural historian. I've been up in 50 of these or more. They're fly ridden. You don't go up there and sit or anything like that ever. You know? But you know what it's there for? It's there for a symbol of power and wherewithal and making it and uh, presumably there's a lawyer here or something like that. It's, it's style and all that. And that's what it's there for. But we tell a story about the ship captain's wife, right? Nice story. As opposed to saying it's, a, it's an aggressive symbolism of ma making it in, in Yankee capitalism or whatever else you want about that. And the stories are good over here because you also have a, have a snow story, too, that I'm a little suspicious about, the stories that we tell about the way things are, but maybe aren't, aren't exactly telling the whole story. And so, okay, I'm just trying to load you up with little stories that we tell and all that. But anyway, 
These two occur actually about the same time. They erupt on here. But if you don't know what this is, this is to prevent spontaneous combustion of, of grasses that, that if, you, if you have tons of, of grass, it'll heat up and actually explode. Uh, flames, burn, burn, burn your place down. And so you ventilate it with things like that. Now, I'm an architect now, and I can tell you there's six different ways to better and uh, ventilate a barn by putting holes in it, and they knew that, or multiple ventilators up there, easily better than that. But it wouldn't look as powerful. It wouldn't look as strong as that. When someone does this, they, are, they, 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 they demonstrate a wherewithal, a knowledge of the latest technology and, and uh, ability to understand, you know, agricultural whatever, and that symbol is there. The fact that they occur at the same time is an interesting kind of thing about <laughs> maybe influencing each other both ways or something like that. But anyway, think about that. Uh, but anyway, they're ventilators. They're there for uh, ventilating hay. Next. Here is now an environmental reason for organizing the farmstead. Many connected farms organize themselves as a block against winter winds, okay? And for this reason, it worked. And there's a good reason for choosing that. The dooryard's crucial for a Vermont farmer in the spring, especially in the springtime. Wet dooryard, wagons sink into that. You got a short growing season. If you lose out, you're gone. You, you don't make it, you know. Uh, Minnesota has, you know, it's about the same in some ways, but they got hotter days in the summer than you ever got. And so anyway, it, it, you're, you, you're vulnerable here, you're, you're, and your dooryard helps that. Dooryard's an older English term. The, 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 the door of the yard of the kitchen is what is the older English uh, term for that. And that's, so we have a dooryard here, and this line of buildings sheltering that um, and helping out for spring uh, uh, um, organization of, of, of the farm in some ways. I might add that that's a small reason, but Minnesota farmers and Mich Michigan farmers, people who needed this a little, they never did this. So it's a, it's a small reason that helps, uh, helps to explain the connected organization, but it's, it's not the dominant one. I mean, it, 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 it isn't the dominant one, and we'll see other, other kinds of reasons. Next. Um, this is a good thing to show to you. I show this to other I do this in small agricultural communities and all that, but, but your community, this was supposed to say, represent uh, great uh, farm uh, city, uh, small town architecture here, but you have buildings that surpass these easily and all that. But anyway, okay, this is Bridgeton, Maine, and then so we see all the, all the houses in, in... I knew it. I was just in that the one on the middle this, right. Yeah. yeah, okay. That was the hospital. It was later uh, and all that. Uh, it's a good second empire. But, okay, so we have federal style. Okay, I can... This the federal style, and we have a version of the, of the Greek Revival and Italianate all together there. And if you wanted to be an Italian prince in Bridgeton, you would build something like that. If you wanted to be Napoleonic, you would build a Second Empire kind of uh, style of building there. Or any Goths here, you know, the Gothic Revival style or something like that. Or Shingle style, the kind of, the kind of history. I could, I love giving lectures like this, and I can. I can, I can win on with the Queen Anne style or something like that. But it wouldn't be the style that most farmers chose for their connected farm organization. It'd be the style of you know, non-farmers, or some farmers choose it, but not many. Next. What most farmers choose is, this, we don't have a name for it. I call it classical vernacular. <laughs> you know, that's the academic and all that. The white New England village style of architecture. Oh, that's that's good enough, or you know, you know what I mean. <laughs> Look out on your on your green and all that. The real estate folks refer to them as New Englanders. New Englanders. Okay, fine. Good. This is good. You know, whatever you want to do, but this is the architecture of the people here, of the farm population. Recognizing differences, recognizing individual farmers can you know do lots of different things, but they generally don't. They generally perfect, and you can see the returns here. There's classical molding around the door. It's white and all that. I said, so this is a general aesthetic that was chosen by hundreds of thousands of farmers. I would say like 70%, 80% or something like that. Majority culture, uh, kinds, kinds of choice. i just show this one up here. Anyone recognize this one? The famous wedding cake house. When you go to see the bushes down at Kennebunk Pot, okay, I used to live in Kennebunk, so I can I can tell us with some kind of. You pass this this building on the way. 
as uh, I have uh, in my book, my, my farmer superstar Tobias also passed this one every day. Usually you could say that, well, farmers could have done this, but they didn't know how to do it. Tobias knew this building, you know, he, and he didn't, when he remodeled, he didn't make his farm uh, look like that as well as hundreds of thousands of other New England farmers and all who chose a relatively modest version of what I would call classical vernacular generally uh, for that. When we talk about the uh, style of these buildings, the, 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 the unique part of it that you won't see in other parts of the country is the architectural style of the house is put onto the barn. Now, it could be diluted a little bit or something like that, but it's the same kind of organization there, often. Not always, but 40%, but 30% of the time. In Iowa, a farmer will look at you and say, well, that's a, that's a funny thing to do. Why would you ever put the architectural style of the house onto the guffaw, guffaw, the barn, which deserves red barn, white house, right? Just God made green apples in Iowa. But here, no. Then it's, uh, it has to do with the, the farmstead that you guys made that, that didn't work like a farmstead in Iowa because it has 100 head of hogs. You never had 100 head of hogs. You had one or two hogs in the basement of the barn. You had some cow, little cattle. You had some chickens. But it's not operating like it does. And so that the, the architectural can go on. Anyway, that happened. And it didn't happen anywhere else. So that's another, I'm trying to load you up, a little factoids here as we move on. Next. Um, I'm a zealot for connected farms and all that. And I would say that I'm an architect too. So I look at these buildings and say, this is great architecture. And uh, if we can talk about folk art or folk architecture in some ways, um, this is a great example of common architecture for the people. This is architecture that is designed by individual farmers that have a lot of choice about whether they take this building or spin it or paint it white or whatever, you know. But it's variations on a theme, just like the, the, the quilting and, and all that. Um, the, it's not uh, individual creativity. It's variations on certain themes within that. I'd say this is a good example of, of folk architectural art. Uh, my mentor, uh, Henry Glassie, a folklorist, uh, has a nice expression about folk, uh, folk folk art or architecture. Folk art is somebody else's fine art. And so right now I'm going to take the, take the rug away and say, this is fine art. This is fine architectural art of a very high caliber. It's a, and like art, it's expressive of the, of, you know, art is supposed to be expressive of, of something, uh, presumably, or the, of people who made it and all that. You know, this is absolutely expressive of, of the dominant farmstead uh, organization and how the farm runs and all that. Anyway, great art <laughs> of a certain caliber, of a certain popular caliber here. So I'm trying, you know, I, I, some of you know folk art and you say it's quilts or duck decoys or something like that, but I'm just, all of a sudden I'm saying this is also folk art of a, of a very high caliber <laughs> in a similar way that we look at quilts and, and, and other things. Okay. I'm trying to be a professor here or something like that. Anyway, back to farmers. Next. Uh, there's farm, the museum, have you ever been to Milton? So this is the, the, the uh, New Hampshire Farm Museum in Milton, New Hampshire. This is on the, on the uh, uh, New Hampshire line over there and just, just at Maine and all of that. And so you can see if this, I'm an architect. I just conclude this little bit here and say, that's a great piece of architecture, yeah. okay? I mean, it, it, I'm not apologizing for the, the Volk, that's German for folk. People, you know, this is great architecture, and um, we should be proud of that. So, this has been brought to you by Save Your Nearest Connected Farm and support uh, all that sort of stuff. I mean, we don't have museums of this stuff, but we can encourage we, uh, 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 a pres preservation of, of this uh, marvelous representation of, of uh, your people. If it's, if it's if this is your place, next. Uh, there's other things to talk about: construction systems of, the, of these houses and barns. Many of these buildings I'm showing you here, barns especially, are done with a heavy timber construction system. And so this is an ancient kind of uh, heavy he timber system uh, held together by wooden pegs. The key is the brace, you know, as a, the, the racking and stability of that. And there's various ways, you know, if you talk to timber framers, <laughs> it goes on and on about uh, the exotic systems uh, that are used in these barns. Next. Yankees use these systems because one or two people could pre-assemble a barn um, 
cut, you know, hewn and cut in individual pieces, two or three people or whatever, and then on one day they come together as a community and they have a raising and they put it all up. So it works, it worked as a good, it worked <laughs> as a system of construction. In New England, there's hundreds of thousands of raisings and we got one or two pictures <laughs> of them. <clears throat> okay, but in places where I come from, German lands of Pennsylvania, next. We took a little more pictures of here. So we have pictures of the dinner uh, the, 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 at the raising, usually the farm. Would, the, the, and we, we have diary quotes. Uh, we, we know enough about uh, how this happened and all that. I love this, uh, this German picture here. These are pike poles. They're pushing up this bent over here, that's, which is the same thing that's going up over there. Uh, uh, it's a, in every farmer's diary that I've read, it, it, you know, hogs and sheep, you know, you, know, you kind of <laughs> you know, you try to stay awake and all that. But all of a sudden, it gets to the barn raising day. And you can tell, just the way they write or they, they, they talk about it, you know. This was a major day. And people got together and had a great time and did work. Women get together and talk a lot and quilt or husk. And there's something about that farm life or the ethic of, of, of coming together and doing work that's part of this. And uh, I, I love this picture here because there's about 10 people on there. If you, I counted them out on there and all that. That's a bent being raised in the air. I talked about timber. I've lectured at timber framer gigs and things like that and all that. And I say to, say to the guys, you know, why are those guys up there? And the timber framers will answer in some ways. And I said, come on. This was the most exciting day of their lives. <laughs> you know, when you're up here, you know, it's, you, know, you could see the farm the husband, the wife down here saying, you know, Josephus, you're going to break your head. And, uh, but uh, raise it anyway. Big day on the farm. Always the, 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 farm, the barn and house raising. Um, always a part of, of, of these, these building uh, the tradition. Next. This is a really, this is now I'm trying, uh, Professor Hupke is now passing out a, a paper and pencil, and you're supposed to answer Professor Hupke's question. But here, I'm going to set you up for this, okay? You're driving in the car, and in the back seat, you have your uh, children or grandchildren, and they say, oh, Mommy, Daddy, or Grandpa, Grandpa, whatever it is, and you're passing Blake's place, and they say, Who built Blake's barn? And they say, Mommy, Daddy, oh, yeah, you can say, right. or, or you turn around, and what do you tell them? Blake. Blake. <laughs> Just God made green apples, right? Multiple well, generations of Blakes. Uh, possible, uh, possible, but uh, I'll give you a little more uh, there. But uh, you know who did? You know who built Blake's barn? Next. Next one. Sorry, I didn't say that loud enough. That's what we call an anonymous uh, German. Uh, barn builder. There's a master builder. There's a master builder. Mm -hmm. Every barn that you see and every house that you see and even small agricultural buildings are built by a recognized builder. There's a kind of ideology of owner builder and all that. Now, I know some of you are grinding now. You know, Blake, you know, I know Blake. You know. Did Blake help with the building project? Absolutely. Is it with farmers of less wealth, you're absolutely they, they were there. They could be human helping with the human. They could be. Did they have the wherewithal to notch and peg and angle? And did you think that every individual farm, you're 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 smoking something, you know, but it ain't you know it's strong. There is a master builder behind every building that you're looking at. Period. We just don't know that. Would, in this case, would it be a farm, a, a, also a farmer? Who, yes, it might have been. You know, it's like guys who do fiddling, but they also are farmers. They, uh, yes. Okay. Behind every building that you see is a master builder that you don't know about, and we have somehow forgotten about it. And we kind of make this story about Jones built the barn. Jones helped a little bit, but he did not have it. Anyway, I just want to make sure that, that you see about that. That is absolute. And we fool ourselves when we kind of start, start talking about that. Even today, when you have construction, metal construction systems or something like that, average farmers do, don't you know, usually put it together for lots of interesting reasons about tools and wherewithal and all that. Anyway, yes, question? In this particular area, a lot of your big barns was engineered and built by George Marcel, who was my great grandfather. OK. <laughs> well you known in the area. Yeah. Yeah. At the time. Yeah, at absolutely. The time. Right. <laughs> We, uh, who's, who's the builder of the church uh, and that one house? Uh, Amos Smith. 
Say. Nathaniel Smith. Yeah, it's okay. You, you guys have a couple recognized builders over there. Now, with a larger church or a um, master barn or something like that, you could call someone in from Brattleboro or a famous guy or something like that. Generally, there'd be a lo in the local region, there'd be two or three master builder types or something like that. There, now, they knew that. The r local people knew that. They just, we just haven't recorded them very well. It's like house moving or something. We didn't record them well. I love it. Here's your German master builder. Who's the master builder here? Sure. White shirt. I like that clean, cleanest one. <laughs> ah, okay, that does. That's wrong. <laughs> Just keep looking. I, I gotta train my students to keep looking. Some, there's a giveaway here. Oh, he's got the square. He's got the square. The square, for those of you, uh, if you talk to master builders and all, that's the tool you need to make the calcul you many of the calculations that you need. It's not the only one. It's possible that he's holding it for this one, but he looks it. He looks like he's in charge, and he looks like he's the heir apparent. Okay, fine. That's my story. <laughs> okay. We don't make up stories about that and all that. Master builders are there. Remember that. Next. We often talk about farmers as if they're kind of macho individualists and all that, and they're kind of they're cool. They're there's hardy and all that, but there's a farm community in back of every farmer. They share, they share um, uh, wherewithal and all that much more than we have been led to believe by I don't know storytellers like me or something like that who miss this uh, the idea of the farm community, the neighborhood is maybe the maybe the terms that that you use here. And in back of every farmer, without neighborhood, you're gone. And, and you dissipate, uh, you're not there. Next. A typical diary entry, one that we should see more often and think about more often, uh, is, is something like this. I have a major diary that I've used in Kennebunk and all. So here's Farmer Smith, and in his diary he said, uh, went over to Blake's, Blake's place, and we sheared sheep in the morning. In the afternoon, came over to my place, we sheared sheep. Changing work, in, the, in a diary it's changing. Changing work, older English term about exchanging work roles, absolutely part of it. Tools are rarer, the expertise of doing that. Anybody want to do timbering uh, in the winter with alone? You're dead. Okay, so you know, you, got, you share teams, the teams of horses. Anyway. It's out there. It's done. Farmers do this, and we we don't we don't give I think that enough credit because these are and women, you know, uh, all the time. They're, they're, they're shared at sickness, birth, and death. There's no Republicans or Democrats. There's people who come together, and that's absolutely universal. And there's there's. It doesn't happen any differently, um, and that's absolutely consistent. For us from the city, we've lost some traditions like that, but it's a wonderful tradition, and it was there in back of everything that you see, and I'm very much part of it. Next. So I'll try to tick these off here. I'm trying to now uh, put it all together. Uh, why did the, these farmers uh, connect their houses and their, and their barns together? Um, bottom right is Arista County. Um, uh, that never went to connected farms. Basically, they, they get big time toward 1900, okay, after this f f uh, uh, spirit of connected farms are going. So they never went to that um, arrangement. And boy, they could use it. <laughs> they could use a rope out to the barn in the winter if they, uh, anyway, they didn't never connect to their houses and barns. Next. I showed this map before, and this is, remember this, this is the outline of no connected farms outside of this area. Okay, this is probably a little more instructive, and there's something here that I want to talk about. But here's Vermont. Here's the spine of Vermont, and I've speculated that 20 to 40, 30 percent in, in Vermont, when they built during this period, would have made connected farms. That's not scientific. And there are other areas where I've done my major research. Uh, 80, 90 percent of farmsteads were in this connected arrangement. But you know what this map more shows you? This is a map of Yankee English culture. Inside this zone over here, the people who farm are English. Now, I know you got your French, and I know you got your Irish, but they didn't farm. And, and when you go to the records of farmers, you got some, you got Polish farmers in Connecticut Valley, and all, but they're laid. You got English people. You got English people coming from the same county. Now, when I go to Iowa and talk, and I say, you know what's different about those Yankee farmers? You know what's different about them? 
They didn't live next to a German farmer or a Swedish farmer or, you know, not Yankees, not here. You have a unified culture like no other place in America in a major scale like that. You got some places in North Carolina up in the, up in the valley, you know, where they got you know, isolated, but you know, major culture. Now, it doesn't mean they're yokels. It, they're as literate, oops, almost uh, spilled my water here. They're as literate and um, w with uh, knowledge uh, as any other, and probably more so than any other group that I know, but they're solidly English. And that helps to explain the unity. It is not so unified in other, other places in the country, and, but as it is here. Next. One of the things I do uh, is to go around New England, hard-headed. And I go to other places. I look for town deeds and, and tax maps and anything. And, and things art, if you want to talk about that. Here's a famous painting, Morning in Blue Hill Village, Jonathan Fisher. He's a coal minister. He plays musical instruments and he paints. And his painting shows separate house and separate barn as every other document that you will see, I think, throughout New England, that you will see they made connected, disconnected houses and barns before about 1830. I'll go to the mat on this one. Uh, just, uh, maybe you'll find some or something like that. Didn't come with early Puritans or anything like that. Um, it's not a tradition that they develop. Okay, but it's not there. And suddenly it was there. Why did they do that? So I think I can establish that. Next. There is a tradition of connected house and stable connection. Usually it's in the seacoast towns. I haven't studied here so much in, uh, early on. And have you been to Mount Vernon? Yes. It's a connected farm. Yeah, it's wings of buildings. Now, it's in an uh, Italian Palladian classical tradition of, of outbuildings and wings. Monticello, although they bury it, is a, there's a, it's, that's, so there is a high style element. Most farmers understood this. This is about 18, it's connected together about 1830 or something like that. But they didn't connect their houses and barns, which folks do lots of things that average farmers look at and say, looks, looks stupid or I didn't do it. So Beverly, Massachusetts. Now, but there was the reason they made connected farms. And so, ta-da, here it is. Uh, here comes the answer to the question, and do it. Minnesota and Kansas? This is corn. This is more corn. This is a pile of corn, if you can't see this. OK, there's some wagons over here. A, but they dumped it on the ground over here and all that. Um, this is more corn than Woodstock would ever grow in a 10 or 15 year period out of one field in, Ka in Kansas. You want to compete against in corn? <laughs> Goodbye. OK, you're not competing, OK? You, you're not growing corn. Here's wheat. There's Minnesota farm. This is chaff, the, the, the remains of that. <laughs> There's more wheat coming out of that field than, than Woodstock would ever grow in a 10-year period. You want to grow some wheat? Yeah, you ain't going to sell it. Uh, you're going to eat it, I guess, or something like that. One crop after another. You guys also go to lots of crops that, that are exotic. You know, you ever heard the mulberry uh, fave, growing mulberry trees to grow silkworms? It happened here a little bit and all that. <laughs> to grow silkworms? So you, boy, they're trying hard. They're going, and they did. They tried over and over. Everywhere in the country, they're going single crop and going to kind of uniform agribusiness, if you want to think about that. But you guys couldn't do it, although you tried. You tried over and over and over again. And this is beating you. Well, what do you do? Go west, I guess. Many did go west. But those who stayed are the hard-headed ones, <laughs> the ones who don't give up. Retool, next. They developed and they standardized the production of agriculture. And this is the words of the 19th century reformers. Mixed, I recommend you farmers of Woodstock develop mixed farming and home industry. Phrase of the period. Mixed farming meant apples, wheat, pigs, corn, whatever you can to make it work. And home industry maybe is a new one for some of you. And this is something else. 
and t timber is the dominant one within your areas around here where there were timber kind of resources so woodworking in the winter and things like that or shoe leathers for the uh, for the mills and low I mean, everything okay when i've just studied mo farmers who have made it they it usually happens that they had a source of income other than farming you know land or wood or whatever whatever these two things. Here's this kind of cool picture. These are farmers and all that, and they're um, Minot, uh, Maine, near Minot, um, and they're they're making making shovel handle blocks. Do you see what that is? It's a shovel block. Okay, they're just uh, just going out in the woods and and getting a second income. You have to do that. Guess what kind of farm building is really cool for housing? A little bit of this and a little bit of that. A couple of head of cattle, a couple of chickens, a couple of pigs under the barn, do some corn maybe and all that. Guess, guess, what, guess what's a cool building organization to do that? The Connected Farm. It works really good for that. When you have 100 head of cattle or something like that and you've got single operations, it makes more sense to separate that. There's a scale that happened here. You guys couldn't do that scale, so you developed this smaller scale of mixed, mixed stuff as well as anybody has ever done. And part of that is this connected organization. And when farmers were asked to reform, as they were, your kids are leaving the farm, as they were brutally talked and told in the local papers, fix up your farm and connect it together in this latest style to organize your place and And they did. And they conducted a major building campaign. Now, I'll go on to say that making a major building campaign is an expensive thing for many people. So how could average farmers, these guys don't have a lot of cash income, how could average farmers do it? Next. One of the ways they could do it is to develop these other kinds of operations. So you have 10-footers, they're called 10 There's wag uh, houses by the road, cooper shops, and all that. so they, that's a Yankee kind of thing, but it's, it's always there. Here's a Kenny Bunk place and all that. It's an average farm. He grows lots of things and all that. Here's the farmer. What's this? Carriage. Carriage. This farmer made this carriage in this shop. Mm -hmm. It's a little, uh, carriages are very exotic and you don't want to do this part time. But anyway, that's the kind of thing they had to do and they did. That's, the, and that's what the connected farm does really well. Because, you know, you can do lots of things as well as farm. This is because there's a farm and all that, but his primary source of income is like that. That happens over and over and over again. Next. So uh, there were some ads like this, it's relatively rare. View of model farm buildings for a Maine farmer, 1857, connected. It was publicized, but not very much. They were hammered by the national press, hammered. You Maine, you Maine and uh, Vermont farmers are behind the times and, and you need to go big agribusiness, and, but they couldn't do it here. They knew they couldn't go big time and they had to go to something like this. So they had a quiet revolution here, but nevertheless a revolution. Next. And they straightened and whitened and cleaned up their landscape and one of the symbols of that reform, after the Civil War primarily, was this line of connected buildings as the new way of doing it, and they bought it, and they bought into it, and they did it, and they reformed. They whitened and straightened and cleaned their, cleaned their landscape. Next. Um, they made long L's. <laughs> they go on forever. <laughs> or long barns. Uh, the Yankees have a kind of building uh, <laughs> theology. It, it's, it's ripping, it's building, it's... Other people do too, but there's a kind of way that, that I think is part of a Yankee culture, which uh, just building is, is, is um, uh, available to everyone, and you can change things. Uh, we don't uh, uh, hold old ways. Next. One of the ways that average farmers could make a connected farm was through building movement. Um, uh, Jenny has showed me uh, pictures that you have uh, here that it show builders being dragged down the street. Okay. When you really see a town that has, the, for some reason, the history of building movement that is recorded, it looks like someone playing Monopoly. 
It's moving things around. The problem is it's never in agriculture journals or newspapers. It just doesn't make the, anyway, it disappears. But once in a while you get, you get it, it, it's out there. So here are horse and, and, and ox teams that are dragging, in this case, a schoolhouse across the landscape uh, to, to, to some other place. Average. No electricity, no plumbing, no electrical wires and all that, no foundation bolts. And they do this every winter's day of their life if they're doing wood by dragging things around. Piece of cake. OK? Right? And so it's, it's relatively easy. And they did that. A typical diary uh, from this one diary that I have, I've seen it uh, 10 more times, is to say that uh, Farmer Smith says, my son Jeb went over to the Smith place with our team of oxen. And he helped Smith move his barn from this side of the road to the other, or something like that. Over and over and over again, these guys move their stuff around. Common, average, and average farmers could develop this connected farm organization with relatively easy effort. Yeah, that had to happen, or you wouldn't see it a whole lot. It would just be wealthy farmers. Next, like this one here because this is this is Yanks. This is a typical story of Yankee ingenuity or something like that. Here's a Cape Cod house. Okay, do you see it? It's jacked up in the air, on cribbing. So here's a person. You see these persons that are up here? So we've taken this Cape Cod house and we've raised it into the air about 14 feet. Okay, you got it there? Next. Keep it on there. There's your, there's your Cape Cod house. This is Bethel, Maine. You go down, down the hill in Bethel, Maine over there. This is average. Now, now, typically when you want to raise the roof, which is a common thing in, di in diaries and all that, you blow off the, off the roof and, and you raise your second floor studs and then you put a new roof on top. Or if you want a 14 foot in a new parlor for the Victorian parlor here, you raise that sucker in the air anyway and, and you put it in and, you know. Yeah. I come from Polish uh, immigrant stuff and all that, and so uh, there's a kind of Yankee uh, 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 insistence on change and all that. I mean, here, from a Polish Catholic perspective, you guys take your graveyards and you move the guys out of the graveyards and all, and <laughs> God forbid, <laughs> anyway, it's, you know, here's where the, your researcher says, wow, these Yankees, and they are. They're, 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 there's, a, there's a spirit of change and can do, or it translates in various ways, evangelical change. In my book, I try to you know, get words around it and all that, but it's out there. And, and that's what you needed to, to maintain this, this spirit of improvement. Um, next. Um, I, what I, I should have showed you a field and all that. There's a diary entry that I have um, that, that, that has to do with the spirit of change, uh, Tobias Walker uh, diary. And Tobias says uh, in his diary, uh, my son Edward and I went down to the lower fields and we dug up rocks that my father and grandfather had plowed around for 75 years. Mm -hmm. So, I, mean, I don't know if you've ever done anything. You know, here's some rocks that are sitting in the field. They've grown wheat uh, and uh, corn for, for 75 years, and, and all of a sudden, they take those rocks out of that field and put it into that wall. Now, why would they do that? They're yanks. They're improving. And, you know, they, you know if you don't understand it, good, that you, then you didn't get the spirit of why these guys maintained that will that you needed to, to persevere and, and make this work. What, where is that farm located, the top one? Uh, this one, uh, 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 South Bridgeton on the road to uh, Denmark. Yes, okay. uh, Foster Hill Road? Yes. Uh, road 717. Yes. Okay. I'll tell you if you want where these are. You know. <laughs> Secret connector farms. Okay. Um, so, uh, just so in conclusion, Winter has something to do with this equation. It isn't that it isn't. Farmers do go to the house, to the barn in the winter and all of that. But it is not the main reason that they conducted this massive reorganization of the farm to, to make this small environmental ease or something like that to them with, in, in the winter. There are other reasons. These are hard stories to tell because ultimately it's the story of how the, how the farming way ultimately failed. And they couldn't sustain. Now, that's a hard, you know, when Youngstown steel workers get the mill closes, I don't know what you say. You know, 
You know, it's, it's a tough story in any way. And, and this snow story, I think, is a way to tell it uh, in a gentle way to folks from away and all that, as opposed to, you know, laying out all the history of what happened, the tremendous toil, and the ultimately giving up that, that farmstead or way of life or something like that. There's a little proviso and, and a little uh, bracket that I like to say is that this is the 19th century that I've been talking about. So in 1900, about then, you guys finally got a cash crop that worked. You finally got it, okay? And then the next hundred years, although you, you, other things are going on, you've got one crop, one uh, production that sustained you. What was that? <laughs> well, not maple. We wish we could, but every farmer isn't doing that to sustain themselves. When you go down the Connecticut Valley, when you see those big farms, what are they producing? Milk. 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 Bulk milk, by railway, by other, any way you want, sustained. Every farm that you see that sustained itself had something to do it. Now, they raised chickens and things, as, as I told you. But it, milk doesn't, isn't a panacea, but it was the stabling thing that allowed them. If you didn't have milk, well, you wouldn't be seeing any of these, they would be gone, way, be way gone. Um, you'd see a bunch of, bunch of uh, guys growing beets or something like that uh, for uh, small markets. So anyway, that sustained you. That's another story that I could tell or something like that. But that's, that, so all of a sudden, all these farms that are limping into the 20s, they, they finally go to a, usually a dominant uh, milk uh, production and something like that, and that sustains most of it. But that's another kind of story here. So anyway, so here's the story. So the winners out there is part of the story. I think this story is about survival and a, a great effort, a great positive uh, uh, evangelical effort to sustain and to make it work. Remember, they're leaving, and we'll just see that. They're going to leave in just a second. Next, last two slides. So here's a, Bethel has a great photographic collection, so I use them a lot over here. So here's a farm near Bethel. They moved this house into line and made a connected farm. <laughs> okay. It's not too hard to build it, maybe move this one here. Maybe it was two parts they moved it, but anyway, they got it. I'm part of the new revolution, connected farms over here. Look. They also took out those horrible nine over six windows. I'm, I'm winking at some of you antique guys over here. And they, <laughs> and they ripped them out of here and put the new modern two over two windows of it. You know, and here's those the pig shed, pig shed that's, that's the old nine over sixes over there. And they ripped out that horrible old uh, center fireplace with those horrible fireplaces, oh, uh, ugly. And they put in stoves, okay, okay. You know, right. Planted some sugar maples out in front, mm -hmm. okay? And most of all, what's this? Vermont. Have you ever seen a Vermont farm with the, with the yard of the front door with rocks in it? The answer is no. No. You've never, do you, did, they, did they have a space gun to, uh, how, how, how did, what happened? They, <laughs> they got taken out, okay? They got, you know, there's an ethic there, okay? It's impossible to think of a, a, a front door yard of a Vermont place that had this, God forbid. <laughs> yeah. If you understand that, you understand something about this people, about, about the way that they, they hit that landscape with, with a kind of uh, vengeance in some ways. That is uh, not, uh, I don't understand too well, but I can see it. And, uh, and I know that happened, and we can absolutely record that. These rocks are now in a wall where they should be, <laughs> and all that, and that, that's what happened. So last slide. This is a rare photo, but it's a, it's a good one. You just don't see photos like that. Here's the milk pail out there. This could be staged, but it's so good. Let's, let's present, pretend it's, it's, it's the real thing. One of the more poignant stories of Vermont and New Hampshire or, or Maine is, is the story of, told in many different ways of those who stayed and those who went. I mean, it's a classic you know, typology of, of story, and it's a poignant story. You know, it's like... You can't subdivide a Vermont farm, okay? After 1800, there's no subdivision. It's barely working you know, as a unified farm, but you know, can't cut it in half with the two kids or whatever else. Said. So someone's got to go, and someone's, and someone's said. So there's also, beyond going and staying, there's also the idea that the farming way can't sustain, and we've got to go be a mechanic in the village or something else. The farming way can't sustain the population so there's people that are going, and there's people that are staying. And I'm talking about those people who stayed. And so if this is your folk, 
I mean, here's the Polish immigrant saying, this is a marvelous story. It's a marvelous story of perseverance, about making, about, you know, you should have gave up. <laughs> you know, uh, Ohio's going to hit you pretty hard. But they sustained it. And they, they, they sustained this, agri this unique agricultural, a little bit of this, a little bit of that kind of agriculture into the 20th century when they probably should have folded early, but they didn't. And, and the connected farm is the major symbol of that. So mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Some questions if you want. Well, you've just burst the bubble that I was brought up with, which was Yankees uh, avoiding taxes and making it considered to be one building and uh, they didn't get taxed as much. No, that, that's. My grandmother told me that. Well, that that's a good story. I like the story. <laughs> funny. Yeah. Well, anyway, it doesn't, we don't tax that way in most municipalities that, that I know. So. But good, I like that. <laughs> well, 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 you have a wonderful job describing it. I was brought up with horses. My ancestors moved in here after the revolution. You did a wonderful job of describing it. But I got one question. Some would not do this because sometimes they got on fire and then they lost everything. You must have some comments there. Yes, I do. Um, when you interview the farm population, the one of the things that come up is the fear of fire. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is, uh, is, you know, people don't say, I'm afraid of fire, nothing like that. But when you talk about it, I've interviewed maybe two or three, I forget, at least two women who did not leave the farmstead for the last 30 or 40 years of their life when I interviewed them because of the threat of fire. Ever. I mean, boy, here's a city guy going, whoa, <laughs> whoa. You know, that's, uh, that's the extreme, but it, no people understood the threat of fire more than a farmer. Just period. These guys weren't naive about that. They knew about that, and yet they still connected their buildings together. I'll just say that. So that's, that's it. Uh, there, they, there was the threat. They understood it as well as anyone. But this convenience of putting it together for their agriculture operation seemed to overweigh that, and they did. I'll just end it with they did. <laughs> and they and they knew about fire. I, this I can I can tell from every interview that I had. It wasn't like oh gee this thing could burn down. <laughs> no, no 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 they uh, spontaneous the combustion of, of the gr of the grain. Uh, they understood things like that far better than anybody. So and they did anyway. I just have a comment. My grandfather was born in 1898, and when he had to use the bathroom, he would always say, "I have to go to the back house." <laughs> Fine. Excellent. Fine. And I didn't mention, you know, there's the four holder and three holder in the in the back house, and and typically it's the the back corner of the back house, you know, is that's the just before the barn is the place for the uh, outhouse uh, that, that we say. So, so. How does the great round barn of New England fit into your scenario from 1850s to sure. like 1900? These are the round barns, uh, the famous one at uh, Hancock Village uh, around. There's also round houses and round barns. So, but let's just stick with barns. Um, there's throughout American agricultural journals between 1840 to 1900, one or two articles maybe per journal or something like that. Either someone saying you should do this, or you know, I did it, you know, or something like that. This is perfectionist architecture. I'm an architect. I, I you know, like. Give me a perfect square, and, oh, and I kind of whoosh, and all that. There's, it's intellectually an interesting issue. The Shaker barn is functionally bad for, you know, it, when you put your grain in this, it doesn't work. Anyway, farmers who could easily done that and understood this literature never did this. It, it just it took great wealth and chutzpah <laughs> to put this together. But people do this, you know, if you, people have built uh, grand houses that are, you know, either geometrically weird or is per perfect in some ways, I, I, call it, I call it perfectionism. And so it's, there's a spirit of doing this, uh, which is more theological or uh, not practical. In the journals, a couple farmers would, I wish I should quote them and say, they would said, the article that you just had was just garbage. I, this is a stupid idea because it's not going to work. But, but, for, but there's, a, there's a spirit of that with my people, the architects who you know, look for you know, unique solutions or something like that to push the, push the limits of design or something like that. Also with the shakers, it's more religious. There's a, there's a symbolism of God's bounty, and so that, there's an up level of that, which 
the farmers, many farmers who did, didn't have that. But for the Shakers and for the other religious communities who do those things, um, this, is, this is putting your agricultural uh, way into a, a divine form. And the Shakers, I think, would be an example of that. Average farmers, not so much. You know, it didn't work very well. So in spite of the literature, <laughs> it's just, you know, farmers tested this out and said, you know, this, is, this, this doesn't work. And they didn't do it, is the answer finally to that. So why were these connected farm buildings not built in the Champlain Valley or west of the Green Mountains? I, 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 I wish I could tell it all. I'd stay here for another hour. <laughs> um, when you get to the spine of the Green Mountains and start going downhill and all that, you get Dutch, you get you get a kind of urban, uh, you get other kinds of ideas, and they compete with this rather homogeneous English Yankee culture. So it's you heard it be spreading out; it gets less and less. But once you get down the downside over there, you're into the Dutch, uh, uh, New England, uh, New, uh, New York kind of uh, uh, cosmopolitan, uh, other kinds of influences. Boom. It took a unified culture to sustain this, and you know, and, and it did. It, it, so it's a cultural argument there. I, I, it's solid. Um, you know, right down the middle. You, you got a couple. One connected farm on the on the downside over it does not disprove this theory. So the exception does not disprove this rule. You know, but 99% uh, would start to, I think, sustain the rule. So in my neighborhood, there's a whole bunch of capes that were all, they're all exactly the same, starting 1810, maybe up through 1820. And I always wondered who showed the farmers or helped the farmers to build it. Would it have been an itinerant kind of a guy going from town to town, or would it have been somebody living in the town or neighborhood that would help them design and build the cape? Because an average farmer obviously doesn't have the time and the skill to do his house. Yeah. I mean, uh, I study house types. So you know, I look at the radar. You know, I can go buy a house, and I can tell you what the floor plan is. And so there are different types of houses. Within, within your area, if you're talking about small farmhouses, maybe there's 10 different types. So you know, now we have to say, within this area, what do the local guys know about other houses? I mean, there's a combination of, I saw Jones's house, who somebody has mentioned, uh, you know, looking at someone else's building. So there's that, and there's new ideas coming in. There's new literature that comes in. It's a very difficult discussion because what we don't have is, is a literary culture here. We have a folk culture. It's an oral culture. And builders who have different plans in their heads. <laughs> so we don't, all of that is taken away from us. And so therefore we're left with, you know, just the fuselages popping up and we have to say how, you know, was it a dominant idea? Was there one financer who did it who would then control the house plans or something like that? That's doable, but it's, it's hard work to, get, to sustain, you know, what individual decision making about the choice of individual plans or... But it's totally practical to have the center chimney and the four rooms surrounding the chimney. And so they did that over and over again, but I didn't know who showed them how to do it. Okay. Whether it's one... Well, no, this has been done. This is, this is a floor plan that's come to England for 200 years being perfected. This is memorized by countless people. So it, for you and I, we kind of discovered four rooms. Or, no, 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 no. It, it's like uh, how did you how did you, a baking tradition? I, if I don't know you, how, how did you learn your pie? Well, it's come down for grandmothers, and and, and and you just didn't invent it. It's that ability to see the progression of this in culture possessed by many people who built that allowed different decision makings uh, to go on. We just don't have that. We, you know, but uh, you do have you know, your cooking ability or something like that. If I had, had to I'm looking for a certain skill you have that allows you to understand this, this progression of ideas that are kind of well known by everyone. And so individual farmers are choosing you know, the type of barn or something like that because I've seen others, journals and all that. And so it's, it's simply hard to uh, get average people uh, before. You know, written accounts that, that, that tell us everything about that. Good question. I know your map of uh, percentages of extended houses and barns and everything else that you've got this sort of deformed bullseye. That almost coincides with the area of New England that has the greatest, has had the greatest impact of Nor'easter. But in the winter. about the impact of Nor'easter, winter, Storms. It reads completely. So, in other words, uh, like the winter of '88, which just hammered much of New England, uh, it's an interesting coincidence. So, we're talking about severe winters um, that relate to the Northeast 
Okay. But I, I can show you in the 19th century with the records that I've seen that it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't do that. That uh, there isn't a, uh, a center, something, something or other there. No other map does that in the 19th century that I've seen. Hey, let's, let's go. Let's go to the library together and, and, and we'll compare maps or something like that. You're talking about a kind of current phenomena about storms and all that. And no, I'm you know, when, when it's in the 19th on century. The East Coast and it's bringing water in from the coast. In the 19th century. Oh, oh we, we, do we have that map in the 19th century? Uh, Why, if you're. <laughs> fine. Okay, fine. Okay, let's. let's, 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 let's coincidental. Okay. It's coincidental. Okay. Good one. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you later. later. <laughs> I am familiar with a couple of towns in New Hampshire, Ashland and Laconia, and I see a lot of these connected type structures that are all very close to each other that appear to be built around the same time in areas where I don't think they had enough land to do anything even if the soil was good. So it seems to be a a common structure in areas that weren't very farmable to begin with. Absolutely. No, I've mentioned that in the town, there is a connected house and stable. So uh, an average, I mean, in the towns that I, I know best in Maine, uh, outside uh, Biddeford and, and other places, there's small worker connected house to stables that were, they grew little vegetables and all that, but they worked in the mill and all that, and weren't dominant farms. And so you'll see six of them in a row, a yeah. little different. But they are not farms. So, you know, they are, then you say, what's the source of income? Worked in the mill, the wife has a cow and all that. Right. And, and, we, and we don't expect farms, to see right. the, that in there. But you'll find that barn being very small, stable-ish kind of thing. You're door right. in a, yes. one side of a cable. Anyway, yeah. so a, a, a certain time that, that wasn't dominant. So, what's the ma major agricultural operation? Sorry, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, yes, thank you. The, the discussion focused largely around shapes and form and structure. Uh, you mentioned very briefly about color. For these old farmhouses, was there kind of a consistent exterior color finish? Yeah. Or? Um, paints, paints always controversial here. Uh, you know, um, big one. Uh, white paint comes in. Um, it's class. In 1800, people who painted their houses with a paint, any paint, mostly white, are upper 30, 30%, 70% of black, the houses are, are black. So that by about 1820, 30, average farmers are starting to buy paint and fix up and, and all that. And that it comes, the paint is moving down the, the, the economic chain to, to kind of average people. There's the color of, um, of the red barn, as God intended, <laughs> in the Midwest. If you ask a kid to draw a picture of a barn, it's red. I mean, kind of, except in New England, <laughs> where they might paint it white or something like that. So um, uh, there's different colors that are out there a little bit. I mean, that's a very subtle kind, kind, of, kind of research and all that. Dominant color is white for the gentry, and then that spreads and all that. And New Englanders pick it up on an average level for the entire complex. It's always a still a, a, a more expensive issue. If you see co pictures from the 19th century of average farms, a lot of them are black, uh, meaning they didn't paint uh, or didn't or it fell off or something like that. Controversial issue of, of the color thing, but there's uniformity within the New England palette of, of the white color um, having to do with Yanks and, and, and color choices and all that. There are red barns out there, but they're very, rather rare in New England, kind of uh, acid red or something like that. So um, that's not my specialty. I, I, <laughs> research. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.